All right, we are on the top of the hour here. And once again, we want to thank all of you for spending your time today with us. Welcome to our TAN Town Hall panel discussion presented by CFE Services, where today we are going to address how to clean, disinfect, and verify. And how do you do so quickly, easily, and effectively? We've invited a panel of experts with varying experiences to provide you with a technical and practical viewpoint on how uh, cleaning systems can help. Let me quickly introduce our panelists. We have Rich Prince, who's the Vice President President of Sales and Marketing for EarthSafe Chemical Alternative Solutions. We have Chris Jenkins and Daniel Wang, both of Hygiena Solutions. We have Alex Baker, who's the Facilities Coordinator for the University of Nevada, Reno and the EL Wygant Fitness Center. And we have Dan Mueller joining us from Kersia Medical, where he's the Senior Vice President. For our attendees today, if during the presentation you have any questions, Please type those into the Q&A window at the bottom. And they will be addressed throughout the presentation. If we have questions at the end, we'll be sure to try and address those before we run out of time. So let's get started. Early in the pandemic, it was not clear how SARS-CoV-2 transmission occurred via surfaces. However, the transmission, whether air or on surfaces, facility hygiene is finally being recognized for its importance. During today's panel discussion, we're going to discuss challenges to tr traditional cleaning methods and disinfecting approaches, compare some of those applications available, including their risks and advantages, experience how your cleaning protocols can be tested and evaluated, and see how some actual facilities and large global companies have advanced their approach to clean. So Rich Prince, let's get started with you by addressing the age old question. Do we have to clean and disinfect? And are we essentially redefining the science of clean and best practices? Thanks, Jim. Yeah, it, it is. I'm going to start with addressing redefining the science of clean because uh, it, it's absolutely the both of those questions. But um, a clean looking surface can be very misleading. Uh, just because something looks clean doesn't mean it actually is. And just to start with some of the facts, in 2020, there were over 136 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide and more than 31 million cases in the U.S. alone. And on an annual basis, over 26 million people get the flu each season. Obviously not this past season with some of the measures taking place, but uh, definitely uh, experts are predicting coming back even more so in, in full force. And to note, about 18,000 viral particles can sit at the very tip of a pen. And knowing that as little as 18 invisible viral particles can make you sick, one pen can make up to 1,000 people sick, which is obviously very alarming. Uh, this is actually just a, a great visual on the history of pandemics, I mean, from the, from the very beginning. But obviously, the most relevant would be to look at the past 20 years with SARS, MERS, Ebola, swine flu, and of course, COVID-19 just jumps off the charts. Knowing that 330 million people live in the U.S. and every single one of us were impacted by COVID-19 one way or another. And clearly, COVID by this, COVID-19 wasn't the first pandemic, and it definitely won't be the last, which is why we need to focus on these proactive approaches that we're going to be talking about throughout this presentation. And 2020 was a very reactive year, which is why moving forward, the proactive approach is the way to go. This is so understanding the difference between cleaning, sanitizing and disinfecting very much. There, there's a lot of misconceptions here. I talked to people throughout the country and there's a lot of confusion. So cleaning is actually removing visible soil, debris, debris microorganisms and organic substances from the surface using detergent water, just soap and water. Really, there's two reasons to clean, appearance and health. And clearly in the past, many businesses were cleaning just for appearance. And uh, it's important to, to really clean for health or, or both, but health being at that, the top of that list. Sanitizing is actually reducing bacteria to levels deemed safe by public health safety standards. Key word there is reducing and disinfecting is actually eliminating pathogens and disease-causing microorganisms by using an EPA-registered uh, chemical or disinfectant. So traditional cleaning methods, they actually get you up to 25% of the surface coverage. These are some of the really 
difficult to reach and commonly missed areas. And uh, water fountains, sink faucet handles, door handles, keyboards, office phones, and vending machines, among others. I always, in the past, have had many conversations with uh, people about how dirty keyboards are. Well, keyboards are dirty. They actually 3,300 bacteria per inch in your average keyboard. But if you move up to when you're looking to wash your hands, those sink faucet handles are 32,000 bacteria per inch. And then if you want to be really grossed out, water fountains, 2.7 million bacteria per inch. And when I found out uh, about that uh, a while back, I made sure that uh, I stopped using water fountains and my, uh, my children and family as well. Wow. Well, while there's still many uncertainties surrounding COVID-19, it's still clear that facilities can better prepare for, respond to, and recover from those outbreaks. And they have a comprehensive program. So Dan Mueller, we talk about cleaning and disinfecting. Older methods included the use of quats. Maybe touch on us, uh, for us, the benefits versus risk of quats. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, we wanted to touch on this one because, as Rich had mentioned, with COVID-19, it's really made a lot of uh, facilities look and dig into the specific chemi chemistry of what they're using. There's a trend away from quads for, the, for a number of reasons, including, um, you know, it's it's a it's, if you ever heard the term quad binding, sticks to a lot of surfaces. It can stick to the mop, the bucket, and you end up with a much much lower percentage chemistry than what you think. Um, what is a quat? Anything with a, generally a chloride, um, if you hear, if you see a onium chloride, benzylconium chloride, for example, a lot of facilities don't really, if you ask them if they're using a quat, they may or may not know. In a lot of cases, they would say, no, I don't think we use a quat. Um, the companies, it's pretty much every, most large chemical companies sell them. The benefit is they're inexpensive, but uh, after you get past the inexpensive part, most places are using them just because, well, that's what we've always done. So you see a lot of, um, we spend a lot of time in hospitals. Most hospitals have moved away from uh, quads for the, re for the reasons I'm gonna go through. And really uh, hospitals are leading the way with, with um, you know, chemistry and innovation. So if they move away from quads, the other, others will follow. Some of the health effects, um, there's a number of them, asthma, allergies. You even have, there's some animal studies looking at uh, damage to DNA uh, with, the, with the use of quats are just, these are two of the first uh, really problems that they're really, these are really in the last couple of years that have really uh, arisen through some of the scientific literature. And then further, um, you hear a lot in the hospital market, but other, uh, about antimicrobial resistance. So these pathogens are getting smarter and based on the chemistry they're using, it's, it's a, these pathogens are adapting even more so. So there's um, evidence of antimicrobial resistance, um, even uh, reproductive toxicity. There was a study where they, it wasn't initially, um, they, they saw some um, uh, reproductive issues in an animal study and they went back and they couldn't figure out why they were seeing it. And it turned out the one change that they had made during the study was the use of the disinfectant they were using quats. And so there's um, a, a, several studies now looking at impaired reproductive health uh, in animals, which is certainly um, quite alarming. Um, and then the last point I wanted to bring up, uh, some of the states are starting to make statements uh, to avoid quats and even avoid sodium hypochloride or bleach. Bleach is another product we're not going to dig into too much, but it's, it's, it, it is effective. So on the positive note, but it's got a lot of health issues. And, and then this uh, link here, uh, OSHA and the University of Washington, um, that's a quote uh, came out to say avoid, avoid clots and bleach. And that's specifically due to all these uh, health concerns. So as you're looking at, you know, your products, make sure to start looking into the, the detail of what's in them. Um, when you look at before and after clean, um, I'm not a microbiologist, but, uh, you know, generally you want to have uh, the uh, results going the other way. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, depending on how you're cleaning, you can actually, in some cases, increase your level of uh, cross-contamination 
uh, and actually make uh, make the matters worse in your facility. Wow, Dan Miller, staying with you as we elaborate on the reevaluation of our cleaning and disinfecting methods. Tell us also about the research around biofilms and some insight to yep. dry surface biofilms. Yeah. So this is really a relatively new uh, concept in terms of surface biofilm. Um, you probably, you've probably read or heard about, most people think of biofilm in water. In your garden hose, if you stick your finger in the hose and you feel that slimy layer uh, in the hose, that's a, that's a biofilm that builds up and essentially protects. It's like an armor that protects the bacteria and the viruses from disinfectant. Um, recent studies are showing that using heavy doses of intense disinfection. And in this case, there was a study that looked at two applications of bleach at 10,000 ppm, which is much higher than you would ever use, um, can actually, um, it, it will have some impact, but it's not gonna eliminate the biofilm. So it's really a false sense of security where you go through the process of cleaning, disinfect, and, and, and disinfecting. However, if you're not, impacting that biofilm that's building up over time, then you're, you're actually not going to be, um, you know, you're not going to be doing what you think uh, is going to, you know, in terms of your dis disinfection methods. Another study looked at the, the surfaces that actually, and this was in a hospital, over 90% of the surfaces had uh, biofilm. This is after a, a, what they call terminal clean a hospital, and that's a deep clean generally using like a bleach or very intense. And these were, um, half of them were MDROs and that's a multi-drug resistant organism. These are the super, super bugs. These are the ones that uh, if, you, if you get these uh, pathogens, you get a disease, then um, a lot of the uh, antibiotics are not effective. So really the more of the research is, is going to uh, looking actually the biofilm and, and how can we impact these biofilms. So HOCl or hypochlorous acid, um, it's a, a molecule that um, it's a simple, it's fast acting, it uh, really goes after all the all the pathogens. It's actually um, uh, your 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 body actually makes HOCl. All mammals and even they're finding plants produce HOCl to target infections within your own organism, and um, it's really it's really like the first line of defense for ourselves when you're you're starting to get sick or you're trying to fight an infection. Um, the HOCL is really that it's that molecule um, that's it's you know it's the first one it's the first one on the scene. It's very effective. And so from a disinfection perspective, it's a it's an awesome um, molecule to be able to to use in this the topic we're talking about today in terms of surface disinfection. And if this video will play, you'll see that clear, that's a, a white blood cell, and you'll see some fluid in there, and that's actually HOCL. And in green, that's a staph uh, organism. And right there is where the white blood cell releases HOCL, and it's able to surround and literally digest that pathogen. And this is your own body uh, working, um, again, producing HOCL. So when you look at, okay, this is, this is like the ultimate um, way to kill pathogens. How do we bottle this and actually use it on our surfaces? Fortunately, um, you know, there's, there's different chemistries out there. Uh, NADCC, I'm not going to ask you to pronounce it, but it's, uh, it's sodium dichloroisocyanurate. We call it NADCC uh, disinfectant tablets. Um, the key is that when you when these are dissolved in water, releases that HOCl that we just talked about that your body produces. The challenge with HOCl, it's not a particularly stable molecule. So the reason you don't see HOCl on shelves at the grocery store like bleach is that um, it's just not a it's not stable. And so it's really ideal to be able to make it um, and during a you know fairly short period of time. The beauty of the solution is that it's a neutral, has a neutral pH between six and seven. 
to be clear, this is not bleach. Um, it does have a, it is chlorine based, so you will have a chlorine uh, smell, but it is um, much more uh, safe and less hazardous than bleach. And for those of you in the EBS world that know what the HMIS uh, rating is, that stands for Hazardous Material uh, Identification System. Um, it, essentially, you rate it on a zero, uh, zero to five scale, and you want zeros. That means it's safe. And the beauty of the NADCC tablets is for health, flammability, and reactivity, uh, you have all zeros. So that's, uh, that's a, a really good benefit there. Real quickly, um, the NADC tablets actually have an EPA claim for penetrating biofilm that I just talked about. Um, there's some there's some products used in the hospital world that have a biofilm claim, but um, to my knowledge, it is a, a unique, uh, not only that the data is there, but actually has the claim to be able to uh, penetrate biofilm. And this is just some of the, the data that was submitted to the EPA. Um, I mentioned it's less corrosive. It's also green and sustainable. I think during COVID, we really saw that firsthand where uh, it was tough to get uh, disinfectants. You had issues with storage. You had issues with shelf life. Um, the tablets are uh, from a, um, you know, how long they last before you dissolve them, have a, have a three-year, um, you know, once once we manufacture the, the tablets, there's a three-year compared to bleach is generally about uh, three to six months, 100% biodegradable. Um, and when you look at things like transportation costs, uh, it can be, you know, between 150th or 100th of the um, weight. Uh, when you look at most ready-to-use chemicals, um, about 98% of those are water. So you're paying for the water, you're paying for the freight, you're paying for the water storage, all that stuff. So one thing we say is that um, uh, we don't sell water. Uh, you can get water much more efficiently on your own in your own system. We're just selling you the strict chemical. Um, the last thing is we have registration for C. difficile, which is, you'll see that more in hospitals, but um, Candida auris is really the next emerging pathogen. If you haven't heard about it, um, it's, it's, it's starting to get uh, rampant in a lot of areas, and it's very deadly. It's about a 20% mortality if you do get it. So uh, most chemicals on the market do not have these um, registrations. So that's another uh, benefit of the NADCC tablets. Dan, we had a question that was uh, poised by one of the attendees asking about yep. oxide cleaners like Alpha HP and how do they measure up to HOCl? Can you comment on that? Alpha HP. Um, I've heard of it. I believe that might be a uh, peroxide type of product. I'm not not 100% sure, Rich. I don't know if you want to chime in, but I would say I don't believe it has some of. The, it definitely doesn't have the biofilm uh, claim. Um, another point on this one, um, we have. It was just published yesterday, hot off the presses. Um, that show a, and this is in a peer reviewed journal, show a 24 hour residual action. So the residual action, the biofilm, um, and also I would say um, if you're spraying, uh, if you're spraying a, assuming I'm correct on this, the HP if it's a peroxide, uh, if you, and Rich will get into the electrostatics, but um, this is considered low vapor uh, chemistry. There's either low vapor or high vapor. No one ever really talked about it until the EPA came out with their electrostatic guidance. And they said, if your chemicals high vapor, you need to uh, clear the room for 15 minutes after spraying. If it's low vapor, then you do not. And you also have less PPE requirements. So we're, we're considered low vapor. Uh, I believe that product that you mentioned, I believe, if it is what I think it is, um, but we could certainly follow up uh, after the webinar. Yeah, and uh, another thing to chime in, I'm familiar with that product. It's uh, the pH level being right around two, so it's much more acidic. Yeah, okay, yeah. great, yeah. appreciate the response. Um, yeah, and this last point on the residual, uh, we're really excited. It's um, It actually even has the um, validation for C. diff, which is it's the one of the toughest next to prions to kill. So this residual action, it, it continues to provide protection over a 24 hour period, um, which is, you know, that's just another added benefit for um, 
you know, looking at different chemistries. Great. So uh, once we've identified an effective cleaning and disinfecting solution, next step is testing or verifying that our facilities cleaning protocols are working and where we can implement uh, improvements. Daniel Wing of Hygiena, maybe introduce to us some of the testing uh, options that Hygiena offers. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so thank you for your time today. This chart here is kind of an overview of some of the most common technologies utilized uh, within the industry um, to verify cleaning outcomes, right? So um, our company, we are a manufacturer an ATP system, also have some other micro, uh, microbiology tests as well. Uh, but this chart is just kind of a quick summary of, you know, how to look at those things objectively, measure, okay, what is the most bang for the buck, so to speak, um, you know, as far as uh, verifying your cleaning outcomes and giving you the tools to help, uh, you know, improve, right, both uh, effectiveness in day-to-day -day cleaning outcomes as well as overall efficiency among your staff. Uh, and so our system, you know, ATP is kind of the quickest, and, and as you can see based upon the totals here, uh, the best combination of all of these objective ways to, to measure um, how you're doing, right, and then really evaluate a cleaning verification program. And uh, in the, you know, next couple slides here, we'll dive into a little bit more about how the technology works and, uh, you know, why it, uh, you know, achieves these top marks. Um, so, yeah, ATP testing is actually used in a variety of industries, one of them uh, being, you know, uh, gen, uh, janitorial sanitation and things like that. It's also used uh, in many other industries, including, um, you know, for the same purpose for healthcare, right, food production, right, where they're cleaning equipment and food processing and equipment, schools, other things like that. Um, so there's a wide range of different industries that actually utilize ATP because this ATP molecule, right, that what we are measuring, uh, it's an acronym that stands for adenosine triphosphate. And what it does is, um, you know, it, it's the molecule that is the energy of life, right, quote unquote. That's uh, a term you may remember from your high school biology class. ATP is in everything that's organic, right? So it's every living cell, whether it's a harmful bacteria or some other inert, uh, you know, type of a cell or any, you know, thing that is uh, coming from something that was once alive, it has ATP in it. So it's a pretty universal indicator of, of clean, right? Uh, because you are measuring the actual dirt uh, itself in a quantitative, quick fashion. Um, so the way our system works, just a quick overview. So uh, ATP um, molecules and everything that's organic, they get transferred onto surfaces, right, that you're cleaning. Uh, the way our system works is there's three parts. There's a swab, right, which you use to collect the sample. That swab is an activated and it mixes with a chemical, a reagent called luciferous. Right, which generates bioluminescence. It actually makes the ATP molecules start to bioluminesce and glow. Uh, and so that what happens is the third part of the system is once this glow is generated, uh, a small handheld device uh, called a luminometer measures this light output. And it's pretty simple, right? The more dirt you have, the more organic material generates a higher RLU or relative light unit. And one of the cool things about the luminometer is that it can be programmed to track all this information. You can capture uh, automatically where each location uh, you know, is being tested, right? To create subgroups called plans, capture users, right? Of who's doing the testing, who is doing the cleaning, and actually many other details around uh, you know, the details of, of the outcome here. And the goal, right, is to really focus on the first part of what we talked about before, right? How cleaning and sanitizing are two distinct separate steps. Cleaning, if you think about it, right? That's the part you have control over anyway, right? That's the way that your staff your janitorial crew is trained to do a protocol, right? A process to achieve the best possible outcome and minimize this biofilm that builds up on high touch surfaces. Um, and then what happens is when you follow that up with a sanitizing step, right? That's a really good one-two punch to have a really effective, um, very also efficient cleaning protocol and give yourself multiple chances to minimize the risk and kill any types of you know, viruses or bacteria or things like that on these high touch surfaces where you can test uh, to maximize, uh, you know, the, the, the bang for the buck you're getting from your cleaning outcomes. And um, this is just a table here, it really kind of highlights uh, the, the benefits, right, of, you know, measuring the biofilm. Because, you know, again, high-touch objects, things like your keyboard, your, your, uh, your phone, your, your light switches, right, all these places that are touched all the time, you know, by a lot of people in, in, a, in a public space, like, a, like an office building or a school or whatever, right, the biofilm builds up. And then after you've cleaned properly, right, you should have a significant reduction in those biofilm levels, which again, then follow that up with a sanitizing step 
and you have this strong combination to make sure that you're removing the biofilm and then killing any germs that are left behind. And again, this technology is used in a wide variety of, of industries, right? I mentioned healthcare, food production, um, you know, due to the, the pandemic here over the last year and a half or so, uh, we've seen an increase in additional uh, people that don't have the same regulatory requirement, right? You know, in like a hospital or a food produ uh, production facility where you have to have this verification step as part of your daily protocols. Uh, places like airlines or cruise lines or gyms, right? Fitness facilities, uh, transportation, you know, schools, again, I mentioned, you know, other public uh, institutional type of facilities, um, they don't have to do this testing, right? But it is a best practice to, again, help your team uh, control what they can control, right? And achieve the best possible outcomes uh, in their daily cleaning protocols. Um, so a little bit more about our system in particular, right? This device here pictured is what we call the Ensure Touch. It's the luminometer device that actually reads the swabs, right? Once they are, are you know, samples collected and then they're then activated. So the machine works a lot like a phone, which hopefully what you, you think of when you see this. And that's by design, right? Uh, pretty much everyone has a, a smartphone in their pocket or on their desk and you're by them now. And um, you know, if you think back to when you got that, right, it's probably so intuitive to use. You can pick it up and kind of figure it out with very minimal training. That's the model we built this device on. And we hope that holds true for our users as they can really pick it up and, and get up and running um, and really still be able to highly customize their testing pro protocols and programs and track all this data in a very effective manner. Um, this screen just highlights some of the different apps, if you will, the, the different features of the software that again are all built around how do you track this information? How do you get the most bang for the buck and learn the most that you can to make sure that every test that you take with our system to verify how you're doing the cleaning, you can learn from that and then apply you know, improvements the next time you go back to sample that area or clean that area. Um, this uh, picture here, this is the ultra snap. This is the device that I mentioned, the actual the swab. So what happens is you just open up, you know, the two parts of the device, right? You swab a surface, right? That's again, picking up this biofilm, right? This invisible organic residue that's left behind, you know, when you touch items and, you know, transfer bacteria around. Um, then you activate the test device, right? So a little snap, snap, uh, squeeze, squeeze here with our patented snap valve technology. Uh, that mixes the little bit of liquid that starts off in the bulb up at the top there with your sample that's you know, stuck to the, the, the swab end. You shake for just a few seconds, and then you put the whole device into the luminometer, hit the, the run test button, and in just about 10 seconds, you'll have your result. Again, an instant, you know, or near instant, quantified uh, measurement of a clean, right, based upon how you define it. And because it's a quantitative test, right, and you're getting results in these relative light units, the system allows you to designate uh, what your target is, what clean needs to be. And that is a function of, you know, well, how risky is that location? If you're cleaning, uh, you know, equipment and surfaces and things like that in a high risk type of facility, think at a hospital, like an operating room or, you know, surgery uh, you know, location, something like that, you're going to have a much higher standard than maybe out in the waiting room of that same uh, hospital. And so when you create these test locations and, you know, create groups of locations called test plans, you can take into these things uh, into account and set the whole system up in a way that you can capture, again, the details of who, what, when, where, all these details about every single test that you run to enable yourself to learn the most from it. So that's a quick overview of the system. And um, yeah, the, uh, well, I'm sure we'll have a little bit of time here at the end for more questions, but uh, we'll move on to the next uh, section here. Alex Baker, well, we've got a chance. Let's talk a little bit about the University of Nevada, Reno. And can you share what kind of changes you've had to implement in your facilities cleaning protocols based on not only health department recommendations, but also the need and the scope of your facility? Because you've got a beautiful facility there on the campus. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thanks, Jim. Um, so yeah, so uh, we are a, you know, it's a, a fitness facility. And so naturally, like, you know, cleaning has been our, on our forefront since day one. Um, we get a lot of traffic, a lot of sweat through the door. Um, and so we, we pride our, ourselves on cleaning. Um, initially, when, when uh, you know, everything was going on in the media, um, before we closed, uh, we, you know, we just went back and retrained our staff, um, let, them, let them know the, the difference between cleaning and actually disinfecting um, surfaces. Because um, that's, that's a huge one. I think we, we forget to, you know, at times when we go back, we, we focus so much on clean, 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 but, you know, taking that extra step and disinfecting. So initially we went out of the way, we added more cleaning tables throughout the facility, um, educated our staff, educated our, our, pay, our patrons, our members 
Um, and then on the on the back end, knowing that we had to prepare stock up, um, you know, and make sure that we had we had the stockpile available and ready because we knew if we ran out of that stuff, we were going to be we were going to be in a hole. Um, and so we went out of the way, we reached out to, to companies, worked with CF, CFE um, and got that uh, got that cleaning supply on, you know, on site um, as soon as possible. So initially we educated our staff, you know, went out of the way to educate our patrons, added more cleaning stations out the facility. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so. Yeah. And in a time last year when we had closures and we had reopenings and then closures again, and so having to be proactive and stand on top and ahead of the curve. So exactly. back to Rich Prince, you know, there's obviously a high cost associated with maintaining uh, any public space. Uh, can you provide us with some reference to managing those resources? You know, Alex just mentioned how they had to seek out resources as quickly as they could and stock inventory and make sure that they were ahead of it. But help us understand some of the costs of the effective cleaners and being environmentally conscious when doing so as well. Sure, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of uh, factors when you're you're talking about cost cost reduction, and I'm going to touch on the uh, with our EvaClean system. We have a two step process. Step one is Pure One. It's our hospital grade cleaner and disinfectant, and that's what uh, Dan was alluding to with the biofilm kill claim. It's the first product with a registered kill claim against bacteria found in biofilm, and uh, it's paired with more of your traditional methods, your microfiber cloths, your disposable wipes. We you see our disposable wipe program right here, which we actually have uh, uh, targeted a substantial savings, especially with a, a major hospital in New York, uh, doing a 35% savings or 250,000 in the next 12 months of guaranteed savings by utilizing this program. Uh, another uh, benefit is actually that standardization. It's one base chemistry, as Dan had mentioned, Pure One and, and Pure Tabs. The difference being with, with Pure One is it does have that surfactant, so it does not go into the electrostatic sprayers, as you see down here. Uh, but step, uh, step two is where the enhanced disinfection comes into play, and that's with our electrostatic sprayers and our Pure Tabs. Uh, it really traditional methods, which I'll uh, cover and mention before that gets you up to 25% of the surface coverage, the enhanced disinfection gets you the remaining up to 75% in half the time. And I'll really dig into the wraparound method and uh, really that time savings in, uh, in a few slides, but also um, from a sustainability, you know, Dan had mentioned this, but we're shipping chemicals, not water. And uh, really that less handling, less diesel, and overall just storage space that uh, Alex had mentioned where one of our 13.1 gram tablets, our larger tablets, one case actually equals 10 55 gallon drums. And it's a 65 cents uh, a gallon uh, compared to liquid disinfectants between 25 and $30 a gallon. So that's where some additional savings comes in comes into play as well. And you see just the comparison here. Next Alex, slide. Alex Baker, we're gonna jump back over to you. Uh, this past year, what are some of the ways that you're demonstrating to students, employees, guests, members that they're returning to a safe environment at the UNR's EL Ligand Fitness Center? Obviously visibility is seeing what you're doing, how you're doing it, uh, gives them that peace of mind. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, you know, it's it's uh, being at the campus. We get uh, you know your college age students all the way up to your professors, and so we get a big range of audiences. And uh, you know, Baker coming through the facility, um, trying to lick every doorknob to your uh, professor, walking in with the bubble suit, asking questions about what you guys are doing to ensure safety. Um, and so we do stress that enough. And so we have a great marketing team, our social media team, um, that goes out of the way creating videos to show to our campus community. Um, about properly dis disinfecting, um, cleaning their their stations after they're done, and then what we do on our end um, in terms of like with our student staff, uh, they're constantly going through the through the facilities, um, and I think that shows I think that shows a lot when you know members can walk in, they see staff constantly going through wiping down the equipment, spraying down the equipment. Um, I think they if, you know that ease of mind um, is better for them as they continue to use the fitness center. Um, 
and uh and yeah then working with you guys and you know trying to get some uh um you know de decals that we can kind of hang up in our facility um is another thing that we are you know we were taking so I also hear, and we're going to see some pictures of your team in action a little bit later, but you got a special name for the cart uh, that you use to uh, treat the facility. What was that name again? Oh, yeah. The Covenator. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, so that, so when we, yeah, when uh talk about some of the changes we made when reopening, um, that's definitely one of the changes that we made, so. Yeah, you know, you hit it. Social media is such a powerful uh, platform and it's certainly we want our guests we want our customers our members to visually recognize what we're doing and comment on those measures because that's going to not only reinforce others to come back and feel safe about the environment that they're returning to um, but uh, to you know to spread the word of, of how much they appreciate the work that you're putting in your facilities rich we're going to drop uh, right back over to you many businesses have faced reductions in staffing I'm sure UNR experienced it, as well as a lot of our uh, universities and restaurants and otherwise, but they still have a higher need than ever before to fend off the spread of viruses. Please share some ideas on how to clean efficiently, but with less time and staff. Absolutely. Uh, so really there's what we consider the electrostatic advantage and obviously the safer chemistries we already touched on, both Dan and I had mentioned, but there's a substantial time savings with utilizing electrostatic sprayers. And uh, I was at a uh, um, Mass Maritime Academy out or uh, Maritime Academy in Massachusetts. And they actually, as Daniel had mentioned, the ATP testing, we did the ATP testing and it was not alarming, but what really, really benefited them was discussing that the fact that in a conference room, they typically did 45 minutes it took them to clean a room and we were able to spray in two to three minutes. So it was great to be able to give kudos to the EVS team, but also say that there's a better way. And uh, this example, this quick video right here is gonna show that 360 degree wraparound technology in, in action. Okay, so we're gonna see just spraying with your traditional trigger spray bottle, spraying the top of a remote, you get the top of the remote. Then he's gonna spray with our Protexas PX200. And you got the top and the bottom. Very simplified approach, but really getting even spray and getting that uh, ability to do more with less. And I mentioned some of this, but really our, our Partnership and focus with the EvaClean Infection Prevention Solution focuses on process improvement, safety, and cost reduction. Really 10 times faster than traditional methods while using 65% less chemicals. And I think uh, commonly in the past, I when I would be cleaning with glass cleaner or cleaning windows, I'd spray as much fluid as possible with the trigger spray bottle and I'd use as, as much paper towels and that's not uh, the right method. We really do more with less. You do a one second flyover and you're putting out less chemicals and uh, you're, you're achieving more. And less sick days convert to higher productivity, so additional savings. And then uh, Touchless technology mitigates the uh, risk of cross-contamination. So Dan had mentioned utilizing the right chemistries for cross-contamination, also uh, the electrostatic technology helps uh, with that as well. Well, and the use of products approved by the EPA included on the EPA's list and as preferable ensures cleaning uh, professionals are applying expert reviewed formulations that have been approved for use against SARS-CoV-2. Um, Chris Jenkins, we're gonna jump over to you. Testing like an ATP meter that hygiene offers. Uh, are, is it all about critiquing the staff? You know, we have some clients that they, they get this information, they're a little hesitant to share it with their team that does the sanitation janitorial work uh, for fear that they're gonna believe that they're not doing their jobs. Talk to us a little bit about the approach. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, Deanna and I have always focused on the positive with the ATP meter. Um, we've, never, uh, we've never pushed um, swabbing people's hands and saying, oh, you've got filthy hands, you need to clean your hands more or your numbers are higher, you know, Frank's numbers are higher than Joanne's numbers. Um, Frank's obviously not doing a great job. 
Um, I, I, the facilities that I've seen, hospitals and gyms alike, have used ATP always in a positive way. Uh, you know, always in a uh, showing a before and an after, showing an improvement in the numbers. Um, we always see facilities start out a lot higher, uh, and then the, uh, once they get their cleaning regimens down, and you know, they see how eye-opening ATP is. Um, they start seeing the numbers get lower and lower and lower. Um, I, the, the, good facility, uh, the good facilities I've seen, not only schools, um, at, you know, as we're looking in this slide right here, but also hospitals, you know, EDS departments um, have actually used um, some of our um, software driven reports, some real colorful basic pie charts. Uh, to show their folks, you know, how much improvement they've done. You know, they've showed, um, they'll, they'll pit like the, the folks that clean floors number one and two versus the, you know, the, the folks that clean floors three and four have like a friendly competition winner. You know, the person with the lowest numbers or the most improvement gets like a, you know, a $25 Starbucks card or something like that. So um, never in a pejorative uh, negative way, always in a positive way. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, it's all cleanliness validation um, in everything, um, you know, that that stems from ATP meters should be looked at in a positive way. Uh, we are we are doing our best to keep a facility clean for children, for patients, for people that are working in gyms, that kind of thing. So, well, and as we've had some schools, not just to focus on schools, but schools that had reopened. And yes. they were unfortunately uh, faced with uh, uh, several cases and had to reclose so close to summertime uh, made it challenging. And, and again, I think as you just said so well, it's, it's the focus is providing healthier environments and limiting the spread of the virus. And uh, this test right here is real telling that we've got a faucet handle in a restroom that obviously didn't get clean or got missed. That's not to say they didn't do their job. Back to Alex Baker, you know, down at UNR, um, how receptive has your staff been in advancing their protocols and taking steps to reduce risk to guests using your facility? Because there's some shots of them in action with the Covenator. Yeah, yeah. So the staff has been, um, you know, they've been they've been great with all the ch the changes that we've had to make um, in the facility, and they actually, I mean, they they enjoy running the the cart through the facility. Um, it, it is, it has been a game changer for us, uh, having that in our facility. Um, you know, I'll talk about some of the changes later, but during our, during our closing periods that we have in our facility, uh, you know, it's, it's always, a you know, the, the staff fights over who can use the car, spray it down. Um, it takes about an hour to go through the whole entire facility to use. And so the staff's been great about it. Um, they, they love using it. Uh, and it's, 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 like I said, it's added great, um, value to our overall operations. Yeah, but doing that task in an hour for 108,000 square feet is pretty amazing, very efficient. Rich, you touched on electrostatic sprayers. Like a lot of information out right there, there's some mixed messaging. Um, there's applicators like sprayers. We just saw an electrostatic sprayer in action and how effective it was against a traditional hand sprayer. There's foggers. There are misters. Sometimes those names are uh, confusingly uh, interchanged. Which one really works and why? Absolutely, thanks, Jim. And yeah, you saw the uh, electrostatic sprayer in action, so really validating that uh, the system does uh, does work. We do a lot of uh, uh, when we do demonstrations. If we're not using that remote with the, we'll use our cell phones. So we definitely have the uh, cleanest cell phones in the industry. Uh, but really, I'll, I'll just touch on what electrostatic sprayers do, and then I'll. Uh, uh, get into foggers as well. So really what they do is change the electrical charge of the particles in the disinfecting solution. So this protects his PX200 right here, puts out a positive charge and it attracts to anything with a negative or neutral charge. Um, as we know, opposites attract and anything with that negative neutral charge is your, your desk, your, your tables, your chairs, anything on that list of hard to reach places, the uh, um, the, yeah, the phones, the keyboard, et cetera, et cetera. And that positive charge creates the ability to stick and rack, wrap around um, 
unlike what uh, foggers actually do. And this is a, a good segue here. So foggers have been around for uh, a very long time and traditionally used for more pest control or deodorizing applications. And recently been paired with, uh, especially over the last year or so with, with disinfectant uh, and chemicals. And uh, in many cases, not registered, EPA registered. Um, what's a, the biggest uh, differentiator between the electrostatic sprayer and uh, the foggers is that micron size. So our uh, Protexas sprayer is at 60 micron to be able to do that effectively wrap around 75 times gravity to be able to get to the surface right away as opposed to remaining in the air. So with that 0.5 to 39 microns of the, the average fogger, really floats in the air and paired with the raw, with certain chemicals could present a asthmatic or a health risk. And these are the different types of foggers, wet foggers, ULV foggers, thermal, aerosol foggers, and the Tomy vaporized uh, HP fogger is one of the few approved by the EPA. However, as you can see in this picture, full PPE is needed um, with the Tyvek suit, full respirator, et cetera, which can be a little intimidating to, uh, to customers. The electrostatic advantage. So 360 degree technology extends more service coverage with less wasted chemicals. That's 65% less chemicals that I mentioned. Mentioned the labor and chemical costs are reduced by utilizing this technology. Really the faster, safer, and more consistent application. This 60 micron nozzle we've tested not only uh, um, versus foggers, but also other electrostatic uh, sprayers that you'll see uh, dripping. And the, the whole process to, is to be able to have a wrap around and no drip and really dry in that four minute dwell time. The additional uh, benefits, and you see that driving disinfectants directly to the surface and in the difficult reach areas, and not only those uh, phones and uh, uh, water fountains, but also if you have any cracks or crevice or in between desks and any of the hard to reach areas, it drives the disinfectant right into those areas. Uh, I mentioned that uh, mitigating the risk of cross-contamination and uh, some electrostatic sprayers or plugins, uh, we actually have the cordless, both our uh, backpack and our handheld really um, allows for effortless maneuvering from room to room. Rich, we had a question from one of the attendees. They were asking a little bit about um, Pure One tabs and using an electrostatic sprayers, the Protexas sprayers. Do they leave a residue and do you wipe down after two minutes with a dry cloth to prevent residue spotting? Any, any comment on that? Sure. So um, with Pure One would be recommended to be using with our uh, disposable wipe program or your trigger spray bottles or mops, it'd be able to be used for floors, windows, walls, high touch areas. And really that's, that's our chemistry that can reduce seven to 10 chemicals because it's a cleaner and disinfectant. But we, because of that surfactant, we do not recommend in the, uh, uh, our electrostatic sprayer, but our pure tabs, if paired with, especially at the standard dilution of 1076 parts per million, with that two to three feet distance from the, the surface uh, should not have uh, any uh, any type of residue as long as you're doing that one second flyover and not oversaturating. I was in Chicago at a, a major uh, uh, building and they were testing a quat based product and uh, in the past and was leaving a, a residue and we, we sprayed and did the testing right then and there and did not leave a residue on their uh, glass tables. Great. And another question from one of the attendees, uh, and I know we've seen some changes in the recent CDC recommendations regarding the uh, requirements for PPE while well, the use or application of chemicals. What, what is the PPE recommendation right now for the use of Protexas sprayers with PureTab? Sure, so uh, currently, uh, there's not a, it's just gloves when handling pure tabs. So when handling the tablets, just gloves when, uh, when handling it. So um, many uh, companies still have masks in place and some of uh, the competitors out there have an N95 or a respirator and just uh, the 
uh, typical face covering would not qualify and it, it currently does with our system. Great, appreciate that. Uh, Alex, we're gonna give you another opportunity to highlight uh, the EL Wygand uh, Fitness Center there on the campus of the University of Nevada, Reno. I kind of gave it away earlier. It's 108,000 square feet, I believe. Um, tell us a little bit more and share some of your insights on how you were cleaning and disinfecting all those touch points. Because when we show some of these pictures, you're gonna see a lot of touch points. Yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, we are, you know, a 108,000 square foot facility um, and we get a lot of traffic, like I said, a lot of traffic, a lot of sweat. So initially before the, you know, before we closed, it was trying to get stockpiled, trying to get more cleaning supplies on deck. When we closed down, um, we knew we were gonna have to, when we reopened, we were gonna have to put some cleaning, cleaning protocols in place um, to show what we're doing uh, to the university that in order us to, to stay open. And so one of the big ones was working with CFD and getting that, the, the, the COVIDator, the cleaning cart that our staff's been using um, that go through. And we actually closed the facility down twice a day, um, one time in the morning for an hour and then other time in the, the evening for an hour, um, right before both our like our peak times in the facility. Um, and then the staff goes through and they actually do a big, you know, big cleaning of the overall facility. Um, the cart goes through the whole facility, goes through our group fitness classrooms. Um, and like I said earlier, we've added, you know, more cleaning stations with disinfectant, uh, athletic wipes, athletic cleaning wipes, um, disinfectant spray bottles, hand sanitizer, uh, those are in every single group fitness classroom that we have, um, as well as on the floor. Um, and, uh, and really just going back to um, tying it all together with the, the cleaning cart with the staff and educating our patrons, but using that, and that has been a huge game changer for us um, because in a fitness facility, you're not just, you know, there's different material um, that you're cleaning. And sometimes a rag and a spray bottle doesn't clean um, you know, some of the TRX straps throughout the facility. So having the, a sprayer, um, spraying it down uh, really, really uh, helps out. Um, we also have turf in our facility and using that on our turf um, as well, just because turf is, turf is, it's hard to clean. Um, and yeah, so we've made, we made a lot of changes um, and we are continuing with those cleaning closures still to this day. Um, so the cart's still going through. There's been some restrictions with the university and the state, but we're still keeping those closure periods um, just because we like, we're calling them these hard resets uh, and we like going through it and just another step that to show our members what we're doing in, in terms of cleaning and sanitizing, so. Perfect. And what we discuss with a lot of our clients in, in multiple different markets is that these measures are only going to continue to evolve, but they're not going to go away. And the reality is, is that EarthSafe's EvaClean solution has been around well before COVID was a, a household name and, and it was being used by global clients around the world. I think this is a great opportunity for Rich. Can you share with us some of those global and regional companies that EarthSafe EvaClean has worked with and implemented the EvaClean solution? Sure, absolutely. I mean, you see here Delta or anywhere from Delta to Marriott to, uh, um, different hospitals, anywhere from uh, uh, NYU Langone to Kaiser Permanente. And uh, really, I mean, in um, every industry now, especially over the, the last year or so in grocery stores and uh, restaurants, long-term senior living, um, really, yeah, travel. I mean, we're We've gone into every different industry. However, we understand that every every industry is different. So we do provide customized usage guides for each industry from office buildings to fitness centers and uh, to make sure that, uh, and we, we customize it not only by industry, if certain customers need uh, um, certain customized standard operating procedures, we are very much involved because it's a true partnership and we understand that uh, infection prevention is needed everywhere. And that's why we, we focus on the targeted education. And just like EvaClean Solutions, Chris Jenkins, Hygiena has been providing testing devices and protocols for a long time. Um, share with us some examples of how ATP testing systems have been helping us during this pandemic and will continue to help us improve our protocols in the future. Yeah, those are, those are, um, those are great points. 
Um, with the opening up of gyms right now, we've seen a nice surge, uh, you know, in swabs that we're starting to ship out more meters. Um, cruise lines are giving us a, a second look, um, although that might be a little bit further down the road. Um, our folks that are providing, um, you know, like cleaning and sanitation services, obviously are really hot right now because of COVID. Um, we've seen our folks from like uh, Costco beef centers. Um, we've seen our Trader Joe's and our Whole Foods and that type of thing. We've seen all those folks doing about 50% more testing at their facilities. Uh, we've also seen them um, ramp up their testing in the employee areas. So, you know, uh, areas where, you know, employee wellness centers, um, the waiting rooms uh, for their vendors and that type of thing. Um, hospitals, I would say, have gone up maybe 25 to 30 percent um, during COVID. And then we've also seen a nice bump um, uh, just recently at hospitals because they're starting to open up for elective surgeries and that type of thing. So all, the, all our surgical folks, um, our endoscopy folks that want to uh, swab their units um, and scopes, insides of the scopes and that type of thing, that, that has been booming also. So yeah, those are, those are a few examples. Yeah, not surprising. So we've got a couple of questions. Any of the uh, attendees that have questions, please submit those now. We're gonna address a couple of these. Uh, well, we've still got a couple of minutes before the hour. Uh, question to either Dan Mueller or Richard Prince. Uh, have you compared uh, Everclean Pure Tabs, Pure One Solution, HOCL, to aqueous ozone as a green alternative to chemicals? That comes up uh, from time to time. Uh, Dan, have you, uh, uh, that yeah. one, I, I have not so, yet. I figured you had. Yeah, uh, to be fair, it's not one we really regularly come up against. I, I did look them up and um, it's kind of an apples to orange. It's more of a, based on what that specific name, it's more of a device that uh, makes some solutions. These products are not, these chemicals are not regulated by the EPA because it's viewed by the EPA as more of a device and not a, um, they call them pesticides, but uh, disinfectants. Um, and also, I don't believe they have, a, because of that, then they don't have the, the registrations under EPA, including COVID being on the end list and then getting into other, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about COVID, but, um, you know, some, making sure your chemistries, uh, things like MRSA, which you see in um, athletic facilities, um, uh, which is MRSA, is staph um, uh, pathogen, as well as norovirus. So, you know, uh, from my view, that product, uh, it's more of a consumer type of uh, device that, that uh, washing of, you know, in the kitchen type of application based on what I've seen, because most facilities are going to want to follow the EPA um, guidance on that. Great, thank you. And we did answer this question before, just wanted to clarify that someone had asked about the Pure One tabs being used with electrostatic sprayer. And no, the, the Pure One tabs are specifically used with a dry wipe or a trigger spray bottle uh, with towel application. Uh, the Pure tabs are being used with the Protexus electrostatic sprayers. Well, Correct. Great, well, this concludes our presentation today. We're right on the hour. We want to thank all of our panelists for providing their insights and expertise, taking their time out of their schedules uh, to be with us. A special thank you to all of the attendees for taking their time to uh, join us. Uh, recording of today's town hall will be made available uh, in an email that will follow up to each of you and you'll receive that. Uh, and you can share that with those that you may work with or know that we're not able to join us today. Uh, for more information or other ways that we can support your safer environment protocols, please feel free to visit our website at cfeservices.co. Thank you once again. Have a great day.